What a blessing it is that he knows our name. What a blessing it is that he walks with us, that he talks with us. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I'll be with you always, even until the end. He knows your name. He knows the hairs that are numbered on your head. He knows all about your situation. Our God, our Father, we come before your presence with thanksgiving on our hearts. We acknowledge you as our maker and our creator. We thank you, Lord, for taking care of us. We thank you for supplying all of our needs. You've been good. You've been better than good. We humbly come before your presence asking for forgiveness of our sins. Asking, Lord God, that you would purify our hearts and our minds. Help us, Lord, to hear your word. Help us, Lord, to not only hear your word, but to be doers of your word. We acknowledge that we can't do anything without you. So I pray and ask that your Holy Spirit would give me power, precision, content, and clarity. I need you. And I ask, Father God, that you would bless your people. That your words would not fall on stony ground, but they would take root deep down in the soil of our hearts. You said, Lord God, that your word would not return to you void, but it would accomplish that which you intend for it to accomplish. Lord, please, in this harvest season, we pray for increase. We pray, Father God, for spiritual growth. We ask in the name of Jesus that if there's someone here who is unsure about their salvation, that this would be the day that they would hear the gospel. They would hear that Christ came in the flesh and that he died on a cross for their sins and arose on the third day. And that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Let this be the day that someone comes and rededicates their lives or someone who is in need of a church home and they want to get back right with you. Let this be the day that someone says, from now on, I'm going to love the Lord with all of my heart, with all of my soul and with all of my might. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you that all the things that you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand praise this morning. We certainly thank him. We praise him for another opportunity to be right here. Amen. A lot of people take it for granted and they skip out on church. But it's a blessing to be in the house of the Lord one more time. It's good to be here. Certainly want to acknowledge the ministers here today on this also as pastor appreciation. We thank the Lord for Pastor Martin, Pastor Naves, Pastor... Holmes, Pastor Gillette, they all serve as pastors and rightfully so right here in the fellowship and we give God the praise for them. We're certainly thankful for the leadership of this church. We thank God, amen, for the doorkeepers. 
Amen. And choir that has blessed us. I have to acknowledge Sister Jackie Brown, amen, who is uh, hobbling around. She's moving fast with that soft cast on her foot. Would y'all pray for her that she get healed and she get better, amen. <laughs> this is a special day for me and my family. It is my daughter, Jacy's birthday today. Amen. And uh, she is 11 years old. Growing up fast. Too fast. But uh, we're very uh, excited for her. And thankful to the Lord that he brought a, her into our lives 11 years ago today. She brought her friends with her too. Amen. And, and I, it just blesses my heart uh, because, uh, you know, she thought to bring her friends with her to come and worship with her. Amen. Amen. Every day ought to be friends and family day. We all have some friends and family that we ought to bring with us to hear the word of the Lord. And, 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 and it just does our hearts good that uh, she's already trying to do her best to please the Lord. And I thank the Lord certainly for my wife, Sister Danielle Watkins. I'm very grateful. To all of you, my Palestine Missionary Baptist Church of Jesus Christ family, I'm so grateful to serve as a senior pastor here. I thank the Lord for all of you. There is a word that the Lord has given for me to share, and it is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through Throughout this month, we have been going through the series, Who Are You? And we have been asking some uh, pertinent questions. The first question we asked is, what kind of servant are you? The second question we asked on uh, the second Sunday is, what kind of steward are you? As we reflected on faith and generosity and formerly known as tithers demonstration, we want to be good stewards of that which God has entrusted to us. First Sunday, we were talking about uh, all of the ministries we have here at Palestine. There's something for everyone to do. Amen. There is so many things that we can get involved in. And we want to know what kind of servant, what kind of steward, and today we're going to ask the question, what kind of survivor are you? Piggybacking off of breast cancer awareness and survivors, amen. We also are survivors here. Come on, somebody. You're going to survive one way or the other. And so we want to make sure you're on the right side of survival. Starting at verse 19, it reads, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died 
and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Being in torment in Hades, he, lift up, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and there and you there is a great gulf fixed. So that no one, no, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, through, though if one rise from the dead. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his holy and righteous word. Again, we're looking at a, the thought, what kind of survivor? We're concluding the series, who are you? And we're asking the important question today, what kind of survivor are you? I need your prayers. I'm reminded of a quote that says, if you judge a book by its cover, you might miss out on an amazing story. Let me say that again. If you judge a book by its cover, you might miss out on an amazing story. Sadly, we live in a world where so many view God's word as outdated and out of touch. From one generation to the next generation, there lies before all of us a constant and consistent goal for all of us to, amen, survive. For all of us to carry on, for all of us to share the importance of having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Am I right? We want our loved ones, we want our children's children to make it to glory. We want to see our friends make it to glory. And so we're trying, we're striving, we are uh, doing our best to share the love of God. We're doing all that we can to testify of God's goodness that there is a reality in serving a true and living God. We're trying our best to invite people to, to worship with us, to come to Bible study and prayer meeting and Sunday school and do all of these things. But in the midst of all of our efforts of, of, of trying to share this amazing love story, I mean, if you know, the Bible is a book of, of a love story. 
in the midst of trying to share this love story, there are some battles to overcome. And as we see in our text today, one of those battles is the struggle with money. Yeah, we all struggle, some more than others, but we all struggle. And as we see in our text, the struggle that Jesus highlights is our struggle with our possessions and our struggles with money. In the beginning of Luke chapter 16, we see the parable of the unjust steward. And even though this steward was wasteful and on the brink of losing his job, he, he went to everybody who owed his boss money and he tried to cut a deal and make friends. Come on, somebody. He, 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 tried, he, he, said he knew he got word that his boss was getting ready to fire him because he was a wasteful steward. And the Bible says he went to everybody who owed his boss money and he cut a deal with them. Just in case he got fired, he can go back to his friends for a favor. Jesus is sharing with his disciples how real this struggle is. And after he told them, you can't serve both God and mammon, verse 14 tells us now the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard all these things. They were eavesdropping. They heard all these things and they began to mock Jesus. They began to laugh at Jesus. And we have to, amen, put ourselves in the text, in the context of the scripture. Uh, it was part of the culture, the the Jews believed that those who had money were blessed by God. Those who had this world's riches were looked upon God as having favor. They, 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 they thought that hey, he got a lot of money. He must be blessed. He has a lot of stuff. He must be blessed. And then the opposite, they believed that if someone was sick or fell on hard times, then he must have been cursed. Are y'all going to help me today? When you look at Job, when Job fell on hard times, the Bible says his so-called friends came by his side and they all one by one accused him. What did you do wrong, Job? When the blind man in John chapter 9 Jesus was walking and he encountered the blind man, the disciples asked, who sinned? Was it him or was it his parents? Somebody had to do something wrong. So they mocked God because they believed that having money was a blessing. They mocked Jesus, excuse me, because they believed that money was having a blessing. If you had money, you were blessed. And so Jesus uses their mockery as a springboard to tell a true story about survival. This is a true story, y'all. Last time we learned that God wants us to be good stewards. Yeah, he wants us to be good stewards of all that he has given to us. But, but this week, amen, we're looking at a valuable lesson on survival. Stewardship and survival goes hand in hand, y'all. Church family, I, I, I believe that Jesus teaches us that we're not justified by our own goodness. We're not justified by our own goodness. We're not justified by our looks. We're not justified by our money. We're not justified by our clothes. We're not justified by our possessions. We're not justified by human wisdom and intuition. We're only justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that makes us just if I had not sinned. That's the only thing that, that sets us right with God is the blood of Jesus. And if we want to survive, 
from this life to the next life. If we want, amen, to share to the next generation and, and make it to glory, we have to come to grips with this reality. As we go through the realities of a survivor, I want you to ask yourself today, what kind of survivor are you? Number one, we see the life of the survivor. Starting at verses 19 through 21, we are introduced to the rich man. The Bible says this rich man was extremely wealthy. He had nice clothes, clothed in purple and fine linen. He had it going on, y'all. Some translations say he habitually dressed in purple. He, he had a wardrobe full of purple linen and clothing. His outer garments had been dyed with tyrant uh, purple dye. And when you look at this type of dye, it had to be extracted from sea snails. Are y'all with me this morning? And because it was very labor intensive and it was difficult to produce, only rich folk could afford this type of dye. Not only did he have uh, an expansive wardrobe, yeah, but he dined sumptuously. Every day at this rich man's house was a holiday. Every day was Thanksgiving. Every day was Christmas. Every day he ate whatever he wanted to eat. Every day it was like he was at the buffet at Isle of Capri. Ameristar. Maybe I ain't going to your casino. Maybe. Every day it was like he was at Harris Casino eating crab legs, shrimp, all the vegetables, all the desserts, all the breads. He had everything, all the chicken wings. Come on, somebody. He had everything he wanted to eat every day. Joyously living in splendor. He was living it up. But in contrast, we see Lazarus. The beggar, this beggar was extremely poor. Not only was he poor, he was sick, full of sores. He was laid, the Bible says, at the gate of the rich man. He was hungry. And to make matters worse, the dogs licked on his sores. Are y'all praying with me? I want to encourage you today to remember the poor. Remember the poor. We had an extensive conversation about the poor in our Bible study this past week. But remember the poor. And I'm not talking about those who stand with the sign that says, I'm not going to lie, I just want to get high. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But the poor, but those people who have a need for food, those people who have a need for clothing, the, the poor, we ought to remember those who have fallen on hard times. Proverbs chapter 31 verse 9 tells us to open our mouth and judge righteously and plead the cause for the poor and the needy. I wonder how many of us are willing to open up our mouths and plead the cause for the poor and the needy. Luke chapter 16 verse 20 says he was laid at the gate. You know what that tells us? That tells us that somebody put him there. 
somebody brought this, this, this poor man, Lazarus, and laid him down at the gate. Somebody put him there in, in hopes that this rich man would do the right thing. Somebody heard that he had a nice wardrobe and he dined sumptuously every day. So surely he had enough money to take care of this poor man. So they laid him at the gate. Jesus says, the poor you will have with you always. There will be always an opportunity to do what's right for the poor. The rich man was so close that when he came in and out of his property, he saw Lazarus laying there. He was so close that when he looked out of his window, when he had a piece of chicken leg in his hand, he saw Lazarus. He was so close that every time he turned around, he saw Lazarus laying at the gate. All Lazarus wanted to do was be fed by the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. And I found out that in those days, the, after the people would get done eating, they would take uh, loaves of stale bread. And they would wipe their hands off on the bread. And they would throw it on the ground for the dogs. The dogs would come in and eat it and and, and when you stop and think about it, we have all this stuff and we just be wasting stuff. Come on, somebody. We can, we can feed two or three people with our leftovers alone. They had so much excess that they wasted it and threw it to the dogs. And it was these same dogs that came by and licked his sores. The dogs had more compassion on Lazarus than the rich man. I wonder today, do you have compassion for the poor? I wonder today, do you have compassion for those who have a need? So we see their lives, the rich man lived lavishly. Lazarus was a poor beggar. Secondly, we see the death of the survivor. As fate would have it, both of these men died. My brothers and sisters, one thing we can all be sure of is the effects of sin in our lives. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Yeah, we all have to pay the price for sin. Thanks to Adam. Come on, somebody. We... We all are going to have to taste and experience death unless Jesus comes back first. We all are going to have to go through death. Paul says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all have sinned. All of us face death. We go back to our text. Verse 22 tells us that Lazarus died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and he was buried. Now imagine the rich man had a lavish homegoing celebration. I imagine he had fancy horses and chariots and a fancy casket to carry him throughout the streets. I imagine he had beautiful flowers and roses and all types of things that were decorated around his casket. I imagine people came from all over the region to pay their respects to this rich man. I imagine it was standing room only. Some people got up and spoke about how good of a dresser he was. Others talked about how much food he had in the house and how much fun they had, amen, and all the food that they ate. But Lazarus, on the other hand, didn't have a funeral. No one asked about Lazarus. No one spoke highly of Lazarus. He was just thrown into the dump like the rest of the outcasts. 
He had a rough life, and he had a forgettable death. But notice the afterlife. Notice the afterlife of the survivor. Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom. Yeah, he, he, he's at a place of rest and a place of honor. Yeah, Lazarus is next to Abraham reclining, sitting at the heavenly buffet. Y'all know what I'm talking about in here. La Lazarus is at peace. Lazarus is at rest. There's no more sickness, no more hunger pains. Lazarus is, at, is with the Lord. But the rich man finds himself in torments. Verse 23 says, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus hanging out in his bosom. The moment, my brothers and sisters, we breathe our last breath on this side, we wake up on eternity on the other side. Yes, we do. And, and in light of the text, again, I want to tell you that Jesus was trying to let the people know that riches and righteousness don't equal salvation. Riches and, 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 and riches don't equal righteousness. They thought because one was rich, they were close to God. But our money has nothing to do with our salvation. It's not about, amen, the amount we have is what we do with what we have. Let me say it again. It's not about the amount you got. It's about what you do with what God gives you. Whether it's our time, whether it's our treasure, whether it's our talents, we have to use what God gives us faithfully. I've discovered in this life that some people want to hoard everything they have. Other people want to spend everything they have, but God wants us to use it for his glory. Sadly, the rich man in our pastor spent all that he had on himself. He lived, he died, and he went to Hades. He lived, he died, and he went to hell. He lived, he died and he went to torment. Yeah, we're reminded that in eternity we'll still have all of our senses. We'll be able to see everything. We'll be able to feel everything. We'll even be able to remember everything. After the rich man looks around and sees his condition, he makes his first request. He cries out to Abraham. He, he says, Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus over here. He's still arrogant. He still has a, a sense of entitlement. You have to be careful of a sense of entitlement. Like the world owes you something. He's still talking about send Lazarus over here. Dip his, his thumb in the water and cool off my tongue. I wonder, can you see him today? He says, for I am tormented in this flame. He still has his feeling. He's hot. He's burning up. He's, he's thirsty. And his thirst can't be quenched. He's tormented in the flame. And Abraham answers. He says, son. Some translation says, my child. That lets us know right there that he was a Hebrew. He was in a lineage. By right, he was supposed to go to heaven. But, but, but it's not about your race. Come on, somebody. It, it, it's not about who you know. Come on, somebody. It, it's about a personal relationship between you and Jesus Christ. We have to come to terms and repent of our sins on our own. I can't make it to salvation because I know Rev. Martin. I can't make it to salvation because I, I, I knew Reverend Abel. I can't make it to heaven because I've been a member of this church. The only way I can make it to heaven is, is because I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That's the only way I'm going to get there. But sadly, this rich man, Mr. Mark, 
Look at the scripture again. Let's go, go with me to verse 25. He says, remember that in your lifetime, you received your good things. You lived it up. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all of this between us and, uh, uh, and you, there is a great gulf that's fixed. Somebody say fixed. He said it's fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. There was nothing he could do. There was no way he could get in or to get out. He was fixed in torment. So it is for those who don't repent of their sin and confess Jesus Christ and accept the free gift of salvation. If you continue to reject God and die in your sins, there will be no way to escape the torment, the pain, and the agony. You ain't going to get out. You might as well just get it right right here. I don't care how many nice ties you wear, how many nice suits you have. You're not going to make it to heaven because you're looking good. Notice his second request. Here he goes again. He says, send Lazarus to my father's house. There you go again. Send, send Lazarus over there. Since Lazarus can't come see me, maybe he can go see my family. He remembers his brothers. He remembers that they look up to him, that they want to be just like him. He remembers, come on somebody, that, 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 that his brothers are in danger. He remembers that if they don't realize that God is real, that heaven is real, that hell is real, that they're going to come here too. He says, send him over there to tell my brothers that hell is real. Then in verse 29, Abraham said they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. And that's the truth, y'all. This is the word of God. This is the word of God. This is the word of God. Moses, amen, and the prophets reflect the word of God. Moses tells us the law. If we come across the law and we realize, listen, we don't need a savior, something's wrong. And then we have the prophets that testify that the Messiah is coming. If you can't hear those two, you're not going to make it. This speaks of the power of God's word. How many of you know there's power in the word of God? Yeah, it is. Romans 6, 1, 16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is power. Not only do I see power of the word of God, but we also see faith. Do you see it? Yeah, the only reason Lazarus was carried to Abraham's bosom is because he had faith in God. Yeah, without faith, the Bible says it's impossible to please God. Paul says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He needed the word and he needed faith. You and I need the word and we need faith. Lazarus might have been poor on this side, but his faith in God and his word made him rich on the other side. Lazarus might have been sick on this side, but by his stripes, he's healed on the other side. Lazarus might have been hungry on this side, but now he's satisfied with Jesus on the other side. 
Yeah, how about you today? What kind of survivor are you? Will you survive in eternal paradise or will you survive in eternal punishment? Maybe you're here today and you're struggling with some stuff in your life. You, you're struggling with fornication. You're struggling with adultery. You're struggling with sexual immorality. Maybe you're struggling with materialism and, and money and all these things. I stopped by to tell you, if you put all your faith in Jesus, if you put all your faith in the blood of Jesus, that was shed on Mount Calvary, if you put all your trust in the fact that he died on the cross and arose on the third day, if you put all your trust in the Lord, you'll wake up on the other side. Yeah, you'll wake up on the other side where there'll be streets of gold, where there'll be no more crying, no more suffering, no more pain. No more backbiting, no more corruption, no more wars, no more rumors of wars. You'll be in Abraham's bosom reclining. I don't know about you, but I want to rest from my labors. I don't know about you, but I want to see the one who died on the cross for my salvation. I don't know about you, but I got a mother I want to see. I don't know about you, but I, I'd much rather be in peace and joy than torment and pain and suffering. No relief in hell, y'all. And so what kind of survivor do you want to be? We want to extend an invitation. There may be someone here today. And the Lord is calling you to come. Maybe you need a church home. Maybe you need a place where you can learn and, and be all that God wants you to be. This is your time to come to give your life to Jesus Christ. He's able to hear and answer our prayers. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. He's able to save us to the uttermost. You might be in the guttermost right now. A guttermost situation, but, but God is able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we put our trust in him. Yeah.